Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast, a weekly deep dive into the stories that transformed our guests into leaders worth following. I'm your host, Joe Boyd. If you've been enjoying the podcast, thank you so much for being a listener. One simple thing you can do to help us out is give a review wherever you listen. Today's guest is Steve Brown. He's the chief people officer at one of my favorite restaurants since I was a little kid, La Rosa's Pizzeria in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's an HR professional with a huge following because, get this, he actually likes people. You'll learn a lot about what he calls anchoring and the art of mentorship. You'll also learn what he gets on his pizza. Steve Brown, welcome to the LeaderCast podcast. We are so excited to have you here today. Joe, it's great. I'm so thankful to be a part of what you're doing. This is awesome. And you you have a ton of great content online. And welcome to the LeaderCast platform. Uh, and excited for people to get to know you and hopefully rope you in to get some more stuff out of you in the days and years to come. <laughs> you're officially, that sounds wonderful. Once you're in, you're in. So you're officially in. Roped uh, in. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you are a, a director of people, right? Is that your title? Chief people officer. Chief people officer yeah. At, yeah. La, at La Rosa's Pizzeria, one of my favorite pizza places as a Cincinnatian. So for the folks that aren't from the region where where we happen to live, uh, they'll eventually get here and taste the world's best pizza. But, uh, for now you are, uh, representing, uh, your work as, uh, HR professional. Um, and so many of our listeners on the podcast are HR folks. So I know they're excited to hear from you. That's great. No, we, we are kind of iconic. I love it when we get people to finally taste us because I'm with you. We, uh, grew up on it and when yeah. people get to taste our pizza, it's like, you know, I was on a call last night and they said they had pizza at this event. I go, well, that was subpar pizza. You really should try ours instead. <laughs> and they took it somewhat well. <laughs> yeah. Cincinnati day one, you have to try the the chili, but then day two, you go to La Rosa's. That's, that's, that's absolutely how it right. All right. Yeah. Tell us what you do. Like what's your day to day like? Give us a little bit of a taste. Uh, that's certainly not a pun. Give us a little bit of a taste of what, uh, what you do all day. And then I want to back up and just kind of hear your story and how you, how you got where you were. Sure. Day to day is full of variety yeah. here in the restaurant industry. Uh, so there are people, items that happen all the time, good stuff. Uh, our people are really amazing. Uh, one thing I love to tell people is it was interesting during the pandemic, they called restaurant workers essential, but we're, we've always been essential. Yeah. <laughs> people want to eat. Right. So uh, my day to day has a lot of variety in that I really don't know what's going to come. I don't, I'm not the kind of person that has a to-do list. I have things that I need to do, Yeah. but we live in a world of interruptions. Uh, had a team member health issue yesterday that I wasn't planned for. Uh, you know, and then somebody said, Hey, we need to talk about somebody who's had some behavioral issues out at one store and then a franchise calls. And that's normal. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, uh, work on the strategy of the company, uh, What's much different about my role than some of our my peers is HR is fully integrated here at LaRosa's. So we are as much a part of the company as every other department. We don't sit on the outside looking in. Yep. We're fully inside. Great. And so tell me a little bit about, um, I don't remember anyone when I was a kid saying, I want to grow up and be in HR. Uh, and not that, you know, it's a great profession, but I don't remember a lot of folks sort of longing for that. So take, take me back to when, when you were a kid, what, what kind of kid were you, what, you, what were you into and, and were there, were there signs early on that this might be the sort of career path that you'd go on? As a kid, I was wildly imaginative yeah. and, uh, one of those people who during school, every clickish group I was a part of. <laughs> so I was an athlete. I was in academics. I was involved in the music program. The kids who were outliers, I knew all of them and I hung with them and I never noticed it. It just seemed natural to me. I could go easily between each group and be a part of it, be fully involved, but not only that. And we all know people who were great athletes Yeah, and that was their primary function. And then in college, pretty much the same way I worked in the dormitory all four years I was there and I was around people, but I didn't see it because it's just who I was. Uh, when I went to school, I was going to be a chemical engineer yeah. for a quarter. It, and I went to yep. school so long ago, Joe, it was a quarter, not right. semesters. Right. And uh, I was failing every class. It was fantastic. <laughs> and then I went into chemistry because I wanted to be in a field that was part of 
before they called it STEM, you know, because yeah. it was the highest paying field and there were the most jobs. It was not doing well. I came home and my mom said, why don't you pick a field with people? Because don't mm. you see that you're in with people all the time? Yeah. And and parents get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you're like, duck on you. Yeah. You know, so glad you're smart and I wasn't. Uh, so I chose to be in HR long before it was, it was called personnel back when I joined. Yeah. Uh, so I've been in the field since 1986, but did I grow up thinking I wanted to be that? No. Uh, oddly enough, when I grew up, I wanted to be president of the United States, uh, which is, you know, small goals. Still time. You know. Oh, <laughs> I don't think so. All the stuff that comes <laughs> along with it, or what are you going to do to get there? I'd rather stay in HR. Yeah. These days, presidents usually are like 80 or 90 years old. So you got plenty of time. You can, you can stretch it out. <laughs> uh, that, that's awesome though. But that, uh, so, I mean, that does tell me you had, uh, you know, this is a leadership podcast that even as a kid, you were, uh, you were mingling around with all these other groups, but you also had some leadership instincts. I would assume if you want to be president someday. Yeah. One of the things that is odd and it's, it feels, I don't want it to sound self-serving. Yeah. Um, when I join a group, after a short period of time, the people come in and go, hey, you know what? <laughs> Why don't you take the lead here? And you go, yeah. well, okay. And I've never thought that I couldn't, but I never thought it was like, I need to be the leader. Yeah, I've always seen leadership. If others see it in you, it's much different than self-proclaiming because my experience has been people who self-proclaim, it's short-lived, it's self-serving. And doesn't work, but I, I held every office there was in high school. I was, I still, when I go and do stuff and civically, I went to Cub Scouts with my son yeah. when he was in first grade and Janet Reeder came to me and she was the committee chair and she says, Hey, uh, I think you're going to be a den leader. And I went, I went, all I did was come to the meeting. Uh, I stayed in the Scouts for goodness, almost 15 years. Became the scout master. There you go. See, rope every in. leadership thing that came, it was there. So, I know you're easy to rope in now. Now you gave away, you like showed all your cards. Now we can have <laughs> you leading all sorts of things here. Um, you know, usually for this podcast, we kind of walk through kind of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey a little bit, if you're familiar with that, and mm -hmm. how we all sort of go on our journey looking for a treasure. And I, I want to stay in that world a little bit, but for you specifically, because of what you do, I'm. I want to think about just mentorship and a little bit, because uh, in some ways I, I would see um, how have you defined sort of mentorship or guidance, but a lot of that is what you're, what you're doing in your day-to-day -day life and what you are probably, I would assume, creating a culture, hopefully, so a lot of folks beside you do that. Um, but yeah, when, I, when you think of mentorship, what, what comes to mind? Is it I've seen mentorship um, modeled for me throughout my whole life. Yeah. Uh, through other older people who were ahead of me, the people who I saw were successful were never alone. They always had other people they were tied to yeah. and they were collaborative and they were respectful and they were passionate people. Uh, when it came to HR, like a lot of HR people, they're departments of one. So until I came to La Rosa 16 years ago, every other job I had, except for my first one out of college, I was a department of one. Okay. Yeah. So it was hard to find somebody. And then, I don't know, I want to say 10 years in, uh, I met Fred Eck. Fred's a dear friend still to this day. Yep. And Fred is my mentor. And he pulled me along, introduced me to people, started making me meet more engaged HR people, people who weren't traditional, and I kind of fit in better. And what I've learned, uh, honestly, from a biblical perspective, is, is the power of three. You, you have a mentor and you are a mentor so that you're always in the middle. Yeah. Because it, just to say I'm a mentor is, again, that self-serving thing. Yeah. So Fred was always like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you're here for me. And, and this is great. In fact, at our last Ohio Sherm conference, uh, we named the Fred Eck Mentor Award. Oh, that's awesome. And so now... He'll be a mentor for people in perpetuity. So it's really cool to see him come and be that person naturally. Yeah, He would tell me of the people that mentored him. Um, internally in organizations, I think it's great to have mentors who are genuine and help people anchor to the organization. Not just lead them, but say, hey, I'm going to get your roots 
going. Yeah. And uh, check in with me generally. So mentoring is an ongoing thing. And also part of it, which I don't think a lot of HR people do, um, some people shouldn't be mentors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you're like, hey, you know, you're really good at this. Right. <laughs> but I don't think the mentoring path's for you. Yeah. Um, I, I always find it fascinating, especially someone in your role. So you're, I, the way I think about HR professionals is they're trying to create systems of some kind to help folks flourish uh, and to be the best that they can be in all this. When you think about that sort of mentorship, usually the best ones are sort of informal. Um, how, how do you strike that balance as in leading an organization and helping folks kind of learn from each other, develop those mentor relationships naturally, and then also kind of creating systems so that maybe it's more formalized? I think what has helped us do that is come to the realization that we want to be and have been a people first organization. Yeah. Because it happens through your people because goodness, in our pizzerias, uh, you have people who come to work when they're 16 and they're not thinking about work. Yeah. They're thinking about everything but work. And that's, we forget. It's interesting. I tell a story. Uh, when I first started here, our average assistant manager was 18 to 19. Wow. <laughs> That's gone up a little, but what's funny is the 18 to 19 year olds, all of a sudden go, those 16 year olds, I swear, <laughs> when I was 16, you're like, that was a couple of years ago. Right, right. So uh, informal mentoring takes constant and consistent attention. So every time you have a chance to have an inter interaction, you have a chance to develop somebody, a chance to pour into them, a chance to help them through failure, a chance to coach, encourage, empathize. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, if you're responsible for shepherding people, we pay more attention to that. Mm -hmm. But we want to have peers treat each other well. We want to have subordinates and peers treat each other well. And those that are really responsible for others, for them to have a people-first, empathetic, mentor orientation, they lead a lot better than those that don't. Yeah. When when you think of doing that, I'm curious, do you, do you see yourself as a, uh, I'll just say like a traditional HR person, or do you see yourself as sort of out of the box? Because I, I feel like <laughs> I know the answer, but I want to hear you say it. I, I don't even know what the box is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've struggled with the confine and control in order to get great behavior. Mm -hmm. To me, great HR is help me, show me what the best behavior is and allow me to do it. But there are things like um, we need to give people permission to do their jobs. Yeah. Like, it's okay. You know, go ahead. Go. Here's your latitude. Go here to here. Not a job description. That kind of, it's a picture of what you do. But you know what, Joe? Come here and do this. Yeah. And uh, it's you see people jump because it just lights the fire inside of them. Instead of saying, get to work. Here's what you're doing wrong. Yeah. That's easy. You know? Yeah. Uh, but no, I... I don't know what traditional HR. I do know what it is. I choose not to do it. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's fair to say it exists, but um, I, uh, I I can I can tell from the I, I've heard of you from some friends that follow you uh, is how I got to know you. And they're, they're, they basically are like, this guy's different. You need to talk to him. Uh, and even I think having uh, your your energy and your excitement obviously uh, kind of flows through to folks. Um when you think about uh, leading uh, as part of a team, you've mentioned a couple times that oftentimes the HR department can get sort of uh, siloed or ostracized from the leadership. Can you talk a little bit about how you work at La Rosa's with the senior leadership and and what what is working uh, well for you in terms of being part of that team? Absolutely. Yeah. When I first came here, uh, like I mentioned, I've been in HR forever. The two things I asked for when I came on board were, one, that HR become integrated, not siloed, mm. and two, that I can still have an external presence and keep the network I'd been building for 20 years. Yeah. And my boss at the time said, oh, that's, a, that's why we want you here. And I went, all right. Perfect. <laughs> well, saying you want integration and making integration happen, two different things. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, when I first came here, the nickname for HR was the black hole. You know, everything goes into the hole to die. And that's <laughs> exciting. That makes you want to work here. Uh, but, I, but, but it was earned. 
Yeah. And I, I don't want to make light of that. It was, you know, we had set that up as our reputation. Yep. So over time, um, I'm not a person who's at their desk. So I went out to the pizzerias and got to know the people. I went to the bakery and got to know the people, went to the call center and got to know the people and the office and said, you know, we're going to go to you. You can come to us all the time. Mm -hmm. But I've had the mindset at this point in my career, if somebody says you need to go to HR, it tells you where you are in the organization. HR should be in the organization. So I never really asked for the, you'll know, hear in our, uh, you know, our semantics, you know, seat at the table. I yeah. hate that crap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, we should be part of the business because the business is people. Whatever industry you're in, without people, you don't exist. Yeah. In some form or fashion. So taking that mindset, uh, my boss, Kevin, uh, we used to meet weekly and only say we, he passed away, unfortunately, in 2020. Mm. But when we met, he said, hey, I want you to draw HR. And I went, what? <laughs> he says, come on, figure it out, draw HR. So I took a picture of what HR was at the time, and I put silos up and down on the spreadsheet. Yeah. And everybody came to HR. He goes, what should it look like? And I took the R silo and put it sideways. I say, because every department has people. So if they have people, they have HR in some form or fashion. When he allowed us to do that, for me to do that, that we could change how we're viewed now today. Goodness, uh, as the chief people officer, I hate that title. <laughs> I love the title, but I mean, I'm a title person. Yeah. Um, I'm in there talking from a people perspective of, uh, we say a thing is something for our people or to our people. Yeah. And then somebody goes, ah, oh, hey, that seems like it's against our people. Well, let's figure that out. Mm. There's a conversation constantly now about the people aspect of business. Every conversation, every meeting, every strategic uh, initiative, it's not an exception anymore. Yeah. I love that you're describing what I, I something like the phrase of a re-engineering leader. Uh, when, when you come in and you're like, you're not saying, I think we need to make a 20% pivot. You right. literally just described flipping everything on its head, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, a lot of leaders, that's what leadership is often, is seeing what what could be, should be, and now now the hard work to lead people there. So I'm sure it wasn't easy the whole time. When Can you take me back to what were the earliest sort of, we call them dragons, like what were the things standing in your way to get what you wanted, that breathing fire down your neck? What were those first few dragons you had to slay to get where you are today? I mentioned how we were viewed when I first started. So uh, incredible mentor as a boss. Hmm. Kevin said, I don't want you to give me any ideas for the first 90 days. I just want you to listen. Okay. So I went out and listened. And I got the general temperature of the company. But most conversations I had at that time with operations is they would come in and say, okay, we're going to win this, 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 this. Because I love operations people, man. They're drivers. Yeah. They're like, they get in like, we're taking a tank and we're, here we go. Yeah. But it was, we're doing this, this, and this. And I said, I, I don't know if we're doing that. How about this? Have you thought of this? Mm -hmm. Let's tweak it a little this way. And people are like, wait a minute, that's going to slow us down. And there was a perception of because I took more time to get context, I was slowing things down. Therefore, things weren't productive. Therefore, just keep taking it. Wasn't true. Vicious, vicious time. Really hard. Hurt some feelings. Hurt my feelings. Um, but to be able to stand up and say, how do we make this more well-rounded? You're doing great work. I'm not here to tear things down. Yeah. But uh, the dragon that came up first was, why don't you just do what we tell you to do? Which is what most HR people face yeah. in companies. Yeah. Uh, and I said, all right, that's, we can, we'll make sure to perform, but there's so much more that you just don't see. Uh, now it's a great relationship, but it took a couple of years to get that going. I'd love to just camp out there for a second because I know people are listening to this thinking that's I'm doing that right now. I, I'm the one where, and oftentimes you were lucky. It wasn't your boss saying that you were slowing things down, right? It, mm -hmm. it was more peers that were saying it. Uh, but if 
if, if you do, if you just kind of know as a leader, I need a little time to figure this out and what's going on, but you have that pressure to people saying, no, we got to go. We got to go. What did you do well to, to get through that? Or if you had to do it over again, is there anything you would do differently? Cause there's a ton of folks sitting there right now. I, I think the thing that worked was redefining what activity is. Hmm. Uh, a lot of people think productivity, which is the term that everybody uses, the more I crank out, that shows that I do well. Yeah. No, it just means you crank things out. Yeah. Um, my wife is an incredible person. She's a coordinator at the university, and she does a lot of tactical things, man. She'll come home and say, I killed this spreadsheet. I set up this schedule <laughs> and that kind of stuff. In her role, productivity is essential because it's how she performs. Yep. On the people side, people are messy, man. <laughs> yeah. They just get all wiggly and stuff. And uh, uh, real quick story. Yeah. Uh, one time, uh, I was at a pizzeria, and uh, our our dough is frozen. And I love and, and the ple- I don't want people think, ooh, it's gross. We flash freeze it so that when you put it through the oven at five hundred degrees, it comes out and it's beautiful. Yeah. So I saw someone training the. 16 year old saying, you know, bark, 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 picture, 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 follow this. And the kid was just overwhelmed. And I said, Hey, uh, that, that dough's upside down. And they said, what? I go, man, it's, it's upside down. And the trainer looked at me like, what? And I said, look, I'm the head of HR. You got to do what I say. Cause I let people go. So I want you to take <laughs> that dough and flip it over. And so he flipped it over. And then all of a sudden the trainer got it. And he said, uh, you know, He's an HR. We work in the pizzerias. We do the real work. Put it back where it was. And so we had this kid flip this dough over two or three times. <laughs> and then he put the pizza together and it went through the oven and it was magnificent. That kid remembered that he enjoyed making pizza instead of just doing the job. Yeah. So where I've had a chance to kind of influence and do things is let's get people to enjoy the hard work we do. Mm-hmm. So that we can enjoy that and take care of our customers and that kind of thing. But, you know, we can do the tactical stuff. If you want it to be boring and awful, we can. Or we can allow people to really enjoy what they do. This has taken a lot of time and a willingness to take a risk. Yeah. Um, to walk into someone else's place and, and mess with people. Yeah. Legally. <laughs> you can mess sure. with people. Uh, uh, but to have fun with people, that's just unheard of from an HR person. Because hmm. most people come in and say... Uh, handbook 2.1.4, Joe, you are three minutes late. Therefore, that's that just sucks your soul dry. I hate that stuff. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I keep thinking of how the, the kind of kid you were is uh, you 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 like people, it seems to me. Oh, yeah. And it seems like your your job would be miserable if you did not like people. <laughs> you you, you kind of you – I know some I, I know some people who are in HR who don't like people, which yeah. is I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Uh, but seeing that there's that, um, and we're all different, right. And there's different kinds of leadership, but, but there's, there is an optimistic brand of leadership and a curious brand, uh, that I hear you describing. And those are generally the folks we love to have around us, you know, um, Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, the folks that we, uh, want to build teams out of, because the more curious and optimistic we can be often, we can find things nobody would ever find. I would love to ask you about what I'm sure is a current dragon for you and everyone else uh, is kind of uh, attracting and retaining. I don't know if I like those words or not, but uh, when when we think about talent uh, and I'm sure, uh, you know, on on the front lines, what you do is built in turnover because you're using younger workers. But uh, just in general, in how things have shifted, say, in the last two, three years around that, uh, what are you seeing in terms of retaining talent? What? What are you doing well? What are you facing right now? What are you working on? We've had to change our focus, just like everything else, because most talent conversations are on the front end of the funnel. How do I attract? How do I recruit? How do I tease you to get in? Uh, What's a good interviewing process? What's a good onboarding process to get you to stay? The challenge is, in most organizations, including our own, once people start working, we forget their talent. Yeah. They're working. <laughs> They're workers. Yeah. Uh, I would rather see us look at people talented for the entire time they're with us. Mm. So two things that have changed. One, 
we're being more intentional to say, are we consistent in the experience a person has coming into the organization and starting with us? So we're doing a tighter focus on onboarding, a tighter focus on training to make sure that somebody's really equipped to do their job. And then the other part is understanding that we're not going to keep people forever. Uh, we get them for a season. Yeah. Now, some people we get for their career. We've been the kind of company that we get career people. Yeah. But when you look at the percentages, 10 to 15%, which is amazing, yeah. stay for their career. The rest are going to be with us for a time. Yeah. And to teach people who are tenured, who are the career people, it's okay that people leave. That's a tough one. Yeah. So um, we're, we're looking at the other, I mentioned it earlier, trying to look at anchoring people versus engagement. I think engagement is good because you want people to be passionate yeah. and into their job and doing what they're, but we don't, it's not entertained. I mean, it's work. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, but if I get you anchored, I, you know, you're safe. You know, you have a good relationship with your supervisor. You know, you are really contributing and adding value in what you do. When people are anchored, they stay. Yeah. And that's a much different retention approach than most. Uh, we want retention to be a reality, not a program. Is that your own language, the anchoring? Is that something you come yeah. up with? That's real. Yeah. That, that resonates. Sometimes words, just a, a word can change how you think about things. Is that, I know mm -hmm. you you have a book or two, right, on this stuff? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I've, I'm working on my third, but yeah. I have two. So, yeah. But anchoring to me is this. Um, if I get you to set anchor, a couple of things, and this was really with the pandemic too. When crisis is hit, how do you weather the storm if you're not anchored? Yeah. You know, when it's time to leave, you pull up your anchor and sail on. It's all good. It's all healthy. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to still, in 2023, think of, boy, if someone leaves, they're not loyal. If someone leaves, they're not. No. You know, yep. I, I wasn't here before, and I'll leave someday. Right. Yeah, I, I do think there's so many shifts in uh, I hate being old because when uh, uh, when we were young, I, I'm assuming you're probably a Gen X or two, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I hated people saying what my generation was and what we were like. Turns out they were kind of right, but the uh, <laughs> and so I, I sort of cringe when we talk about millennials or Gen Y or Gen, Gen Z or whatever because I know every single person is different, but there are some commonalities in generations mm -hmm. and cultures. One of the things I've noticed is the younger folks that come to work with me and for me um, come with a sort of expectation that me as the CEO or, uh, or their immediate supervisor uh, has uh, that, that they ought to be helping them develop their whole career. Like that they just assume that's what a mm -hmm. boss does. And I don't know when we came up, I always assumed my boss probably isn't going to help me develop my career because he's not going to want me to go somewhere else. So I always sort of assumed that was my job to do over here. Have, have you noticed that shift and, and are you are you comfortable with that sort of what feels like a new way of thinking of, you know, are, we're here to help you build your career, whether you're here or you go elsewhere? Yeah, I, we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love about the newer generations is uh, they want affirmation, not praise. Mm -hmm. Praise is awesome. But they want to know, am I doing a good job? They really want to know because that matters. Not that we didn't want to do a good job when we were young, yeah. but it was more on our shoulders. And, you know, I'd have to seek out a conference and I'd have to seek out a network. And I and I like that. And I like the self-startedness of it. But no, I think the new expectation of ongoing, real-time feedback, uh, constructive criticism, affirmation is so much healthier because uh, we tend to forget what we did last week. Yeah. So uh, the old model of development is too formal and too rigid. It never has worked. Uh, and the majority of it has been based on what people don't do versus what they do do. Yeah. Hey, here's your gaps. And we're going to have three goals, fix your gaps instead of saying you do really well here. Yeah. So uh, one of the things we do is strengths finders uh, love strengths finders because it's not comparative. Yeah. It's, Hey, this is what you do well. Like you mentioned me with people. One yep. of mine is woo, winning others over. Yep. So they know that if they put me in a room with a bunch of numbers, I'm going to explode. Yeah. 
But if I'm in a pizzeria with a bunch of 16 year olds, I'm in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what organizations have to understand is if that is my strength, but trying to put me where I'm not strong. Yeah. So it, it calls for different role alignment, uh, different talent usage. Um, I think ongoing development has to be a reality yep. in order for organizations, even for the older generation, because they've just been wanting it. They didn't know how to ask for it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and every generation has that opportunity to to do what is really the backward, the wrong thing in my mind, to say it was hard for me, so I'm going to make it hard for you. Like subconsciously, we sort of, <laughs> every generation, every generation does that. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and yeah. We now have a great opportunity at the, at the age that many of us ought to be becoming mentors. Um, we have a younger generation generally asking us to be mentors. It's a perfect situation. We just have to kind of maybe get over <laughs> our, yes. in, our instinct to say, that's not fair. That's right. I know. Uh, the old thing of uh, my dad would say, you know, when I was three, I was out in the farm working. Right, right. I'm like, no, you weren't. <laughs> and he was, oh, yeah, I was. And your generation, I go, our generation is the same as your generation yeah. on those things. Um, it work is just different. Yeah. And uh, we need to understand that if we don't become agile and flow along with it, the thing that's really cool about this new generation and scary is, if they don't find it where you are, they'll go somewhere else. Yeah, right. It's a top, one of the top three th reasons people leave, which is what we're focused on, is leadership development. And if they don't have that, they, they'll they move on. It's as important as money. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So we need to wrap up. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, – folks want to reach out to you. This goes out all over the world, outside of Cincinnati. Um, I know you have uh, a uh, – um, a network if you want to talk a little bit about that and just let us know how folks could maybe get your book or reach out to you. Oh, a couple things. Yep. Uh, if you want to get connect with me personally, A, I really want you to because I'm very intentional yep. and I love having more connections. Uh, I'm huge on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, at S Brown HR, there's an E on Brown, uh, but I'm very active. I'm conversational. I'm not a, you know, if yep. you're on it, to me, it's about relationships wherever you're at. LinkedIn, you can absolutely reach me on LinkedIn. If you are kind enough to want to check out my books, you can find them on Amazon. Um, it's very easy to find out there. Yeah. But understand this, when people want to connect, it's on. I, I, I'm not the, hey, we're on LinkedIn and I yeah. met you three years ago. No, the way we got together today for the podcast yeah. is someone who met with me and that kind of stuff. If you're in the Cincinnati area, uh, we do have an in-person group that meets the first Tuesday of every month. We call it the HR Roundtable. It's sort of HR. Mostly it's just business. Uh, but if you want to do that, you know, get a hold of me through LinkedIn. I'll get you the information. We can go from there. Love it. Final question. What's your go-to order at La Rosa's? What, what do you put on your Ooh. pizza? Go-to order is uh, pepperoni, black olives, and sausage. And the crust style? Traditional. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So that's what people can get. After. <laughs> Come to Cincinnati, go to Skyline, go to La Rosa's, go to King's Island. It'll be great. You'll love it. <laughs> Just don't do, all, great. don't do it all right in, in the same day or you'll have problems. Uh, th see, thank you so much. This was so much fun. And uh, I'm glad we share a city. We'll find you. I'll find you in the real world and we'll have coffee or maybe even pizza. That'd be great, Joe. I love all right. it. All right. Great to meet you.